Welcome to FII ThinkPod. My name is Francisco. And I'm Aziz. And at ThinkPod, we speak about the smartest ideas and the biggest challenges facing the world right now. We speak about where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. Today our guest is Hisham El Habti, President of the University of Muhammad VI Polytechnic, universally known as UN6P. We discuss innovation and new technology in higher education, and why he believes the next generation and power to innovate will help Africa leapfrog the modern world and move straight to the postmodern world. So you've become the president of UN6P after working extensively with SMEs. What was the transition from the private sector like? It was very interesting. So before going to UN6P, uh, I, had, I did a jump between SME and the biggest uh, industrial company in Morocco. It was in January 2013. And for me, it was a challenge after spending seven years in the SMEs to see if I was able to work in a big company. So it went well. And in late 2017, they asked me to join the university. For me, it was a discovery and it was the opportunity to learn. And last year, I was appointed president of uh, UM6P after spending three years in the management of this university. How did that inform your vision of the university? It's a new way of managing university. For the faculties, they were a little bit puzzled because I'm not a faculty myself. So what does it mean? I manage university like a private company. So it's uh, impact-oriented, uh, performance-oriented. So at the beginning, they were puzzled. After that, I think now they are OK because I'm not challenging them in their work because I'm not a faculty. So I understand what they are doing, but I cannot tell them this guy is good, this paper is good, it's up to them. So for them, it's like a trust between us. I'm managing the university, they are doing their research and their academic uh, stuff. You mentioned that you want your students to be the builders of New Africa. Yeah. What does this New Africa look like in your opinion? In 2050, for instance. Uh, for me, it will be the place that will enable the food security for the world because more than 60% of the Arab land and news so far are in Africa. Africa will leapfrog some innovations. It was the case in the mobile, so it will be the case in other topics. Uh, we we will go from the pre-modern world to the post-modern world without passing through the modern world. So for me, Africa tomorrow will be the place to be for innovation because it's a must uh, for, for Africa. And this is the message we want and we share with our students that think of Africa not like the place where we are struggling, but the place where, where we have opportunities to innovate. So they say that need is the mother of invention. Yeah. Right. And you talked about innovating and leapfrogging in innovations, exactly. right? Yeah. Being a leader at an academic institution, what kind of innovations are most exciting to you? I think in the, uh, in the education, and uh, thanks to the COVID-19, from day one at the level of the university, we invested a lot in digital. But it was uh, nice to have. Uh, in March uh, 2020, the government decided to lock down the country. So we had to switch from physical education to uh, digital education in three, four days. So we had invested a lot, and now we understood why we have in invested a lot in digital. So for me, the most exciting thing is to, to find this hybrid mode of education uh, mixing digital and physical. We don't need to invest a lot on campuses because it's very expensive. We need to leapfrog in the education and the more one of the most exciting thing is to leverage on the experience of COVID-19 to have a new uh, mode of education. We have an example within the university is in the coding. We have a coding school called the 1337 we have now uh, 1,200 students, and there is no faculty, so there is no professors. It's a school open 24 hours a day, seven uh, days a week. It's a peer-to-peer -peer learning, and we don't have to manage the professors because there, there are any. So, uh, and they have having some fun, uh, the students. So we need to understand why we have this model and it works because we have a lot of demand. People are now leaving the conventional school to join this unconventional school and to see if we can do the same thing in the health, in the agriculture, in the mining, in the engineering, uh, so name it. 
What do you see the future of ed tech looking like generally? I think for me it's the future for education. If we want to reach to more than 500 uh, youth in Africa, we cannot, as I said, just build campuses. It's, it's not possible. It, it costs a lot of money. But we have challenges behind that. It's uh, the connection, is the infrastructure. Uh, so we had uh, an example in, in Morocco. So during the COVID-19, uh, we had uh, uh, platform for all the students, not for just uh, M6P, but uh, about 8 million students in Morocco. And they had to have access to a platform. And I think it was after 5-10 minutes it crashed because you had everyone who wanted to be connected. So we worked uh, very closely with the Ministry of uh, Education and we hosted this platform on our servers. And we worked with the telecom companies and all the data uh, for this uh, platform was for free for the students. So we had to find a way to do that and we have succeeded. We have an idea about how to encourage people doing edtech. Uh, we need to invest on, as I said, in infrastructure and in the connections. So as a leader of an academic institution yourself, right, you talked about making education more affordable, yeah. more accessible. Exactly. Right. What would be your call of action perhaps to institutions across the world, right? where sometimes pricing mm -hmm. and, and exclusivity are championed more than you know, becoming accessible, even though technology is now allowing that accessibility. What would you invite them to do or how would you propose they would go about solving that issue? Just to keep in mind, uh, bec because the, the business model, the actual business model, what we call the dominant design of this business model, is we have to invest a lot on campuses. And this is very, uh, as I said, this costs money. So uh, if you want to break even, so it's the tuition fees, and uh, so you, that's why they are up uh, year after year. We have an example in Morocco. It's something in the French country is called classe préparatoire. If you want to access to have access to an engineering school in Morocco, in France, so you have to spend two years. It's a very tough two years, and after that you have uh, admission test, and after that you have your uh, diploma of engineering after uh, spending three or four years. So now we have all the curriculum, all the curriculum, the two years curriculum in about uh, 1,500 short videos between five and seven minutes, and it could cost $200 a year. Wow. wow. And the actual cost is more than between $15,000, $20,000 a year. So we can do that. People can now uh, pass the exam to access to the engineering school. You pay a monthly, uh, 10 months uh, or 12 months, and it's about $200. So I'm inviting people, the, the university just to change the business model. And it's not easy. That's why for us, we are a greenfield university. We don't have legacy. We don't have 200 years behind us with all the costs of that. But the invitation is for them to forget the business model and to think about a new business model. And as I said before, leapfrog the innovation and keep in mind that we have people that cannot afford $40,000 a year as a tuition fee. Geographically, Morocco is situated between Europe, yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa, and yeah. the Arab world. Exactly. How do you see Morocco playing a part within the Pan-African movement? Uh, great question. As a greenfield project, we have been the best in each uh, continent, in, from the US, from Europe, from Asia. And uh, now we have a lot of partnerships uh, with uh, African universities because we believe in one thought that technology is global but innovation is local. So we can find technology everywhere but we have to take into account the country, uh, the village where we are sitting. And I have one exact example is with uh, EPFL, EPFL Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. It's one of the best uh, universities in the world. I think it, they are ranked nine. Uh, in the QS ranking and we launched two years ago an initiative called Excellence in Africa where we have three pillars. The first one is to train junior faculty because if Africa wants to develop itself it will come through research. So uh, that's why we will mentor those junior faculty because they are the future of the academia in, uh, within, within Africa. The second thing is to educate PhD students. It's 100 PhD students on topics linked to the development of Africa. 
and the third one is about digital education. And we are playing the role connecting EPFL and others with Sub-Saharan African uh, universities. And even our vision, mission is empower talents to empower Africa. So this is the reason behind why we are here now. By embracing Africa, does that impact your relationship with the Arab world? Yeah, exactly. When they see UM6P, UM6P is the African university, so we uh, sit south to south. And uh, even in our uh, department of humanities, we started the academic year by showing them a map of the world. Two maps, actually. One, how the north sees the south. And you see that the African continent is very small. But the real size is Africa is bigger than Europe. Yeah. And we, we invite students to look at the south through the second map. That's why for, for, for us, empower talent to empower Africa it comes to tell them what's the south, how the south sees the south and how the south must see the south. Even for our students, for their internship, we don't send them to Europe or to the US. We send them to sub-Saharan African countries. And when they come back, they see the, all the opportunities they can develop within the African continent. Technology has not only allowed education perhaps to become more international and accessible, but also work to become more international and accessible. Exactly. There's a huge phenomenon of brain drain, where a yeah. lot of talented people leave their countries and go abroad and work other places. Morocco particularly is no stranger, broader Africa is no stranger to the brain drain phenomena. How do you encourage and convince Moroccans to stay in Morocco? We have this question every day uh, from, from people within, within Morocco because we have uh, more than 80% of our students got scholarships from, uh, from OCP Foundation. So they told us, yeah, you are given scholarships and if after spending five years here and they, they go uh, to, to Europe or to the US, so you are participating in this uh, brain drain. Our answer is the following. We have now a reverse brain drain because we, we have at the level of the university about 160 faculty, one thir two thirds are uh, Moroccan diaspora. Oh. Yeah, decided to return back to Morocco. Why? Because there is a project. The project is how to develop Morocco, how to develop Africa, and they believe in this project. And we are giving them the means and especially the spirit of this project. The second thing is we are not okay with this brain drain. For us, once we say brain drain, it's like uh, the youth are responsible for that. For me, no, we are responsible for that because we didn't give them the opportunity to stay in their countries. So we have to be more attractive. So it's up to us to develop some attractive ecosystem in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, education, research, and so on and so forth. The third thing, even though, that someone goes to Europe, to the US. He or she could participate in the development of their country. So that's why, for me, I'm interrogating this brain drain. This is the case for us at the Liberal University. We are working a lot with faculty who decided to stay in Switzerland, in Canada, in the US, but they are hosting our students. They are connecting us with other institutions. So for me, this is the best way we can contribute in the development of the countries. Africa, broadly speaking, is going to be disproportionately affected by climate change. Yeah. How is UN6P, but also Morocco, going to tackle climate change? I think the continent that will suffer the most from the climate change is Africa, and Africa did nothing because it's not its fault. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> yeah. uh, so for us, how we contribute in tackling this, uh, this, uh, this challenge is by developing research, development, and innovation. I'll give you uh, two examples. The first one is in the water use. Morocco is suffering from scarcity in this vital element. So we are uh, investing a lot in uh, R&D about the best use of water, especially in the field of agriculture. So it's the right quantity of water uh, depending on the soil, depending on the needs of the plant. That's why we are using sensors, uh, using all the images of the satellites to apply the right amount of water. So this is one. The second thing in the water is how 
to use even the salinity, introduce some crops that can support salinity because uh, once we don't have the, the water, we, we, we should use other, other type of water. So this is in the field of, of water and we are sharing all this knowledge with uh, the agencies, for instance, in Morocco that are using the dams water. So where they can use, where they can open, where they can store and so on and so forth. The second thing is about the use of the models for the weather. Uh, so far, there are just two, I think there are few models, one developed in the US, the other in Europe, but there is nothing for Africa. So that could take into account the African uh, characteristics. So we are working on that with, uh, with uh, some partners from, from Europe, and we will develop African model for uh, climate, and we will share it. Uh, it will be uh, for beauty of science. It's not just for us, it's uh, for all uh, African continent. And about the industrialization and the, the mining is how to introduce the decarbonized ways of uh, extracting uh, minerals, how to, uh, even in the chemicals, how to use some green uh, processes. So uh, yeah, we have a huge uh, department within the university working on those uh, questions. So as a final question, you know, given now that you're leading an academic institution and you have so many people that you're responsible for, that you lead and guide and look up to you, what type of personal legacy do you hope to leave behind, you know, for future generations? For me, the best legacy will be the youth uh, in 10 years that decided to stay in Morocco or stay in Africa to develop an ecosystem and to continue this reverse brain drain. For me, the best legacy is an ecosystem that will enable all the African youth to stay, to believe in themselves, to leapfrog innovation, and to contribute in the development of the world. Because as I said before, for me, Africa will have a big responsibility in the development of the world, not just Africa. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Al-Hepti. It was a pleasure having you on the ThinkPod, and we look forward to seeing you again, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks thank you so for much. your time. Thank you. We would love you to let others know about this podcast, so please rate us, leave us a comment, and share it with someone who might enjoy it too. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our next episode.